Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Clinical Utility of Digital PCR in Liquid Biopsy for the Management of Cancer. I am Antonina Salcido of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, please visit thermofisher.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Atosha Romero, head of the Liquid Biopsy Laboratory at Hospital Universitario Puerto Hierro, Madrid, Spain. Atosha, you may now begin your presentation. So uh, thank you, Thermo Fisher-Pacific, for uh, inviting us to present our work. I am Atocha Romero. I am the head of the Liquid Biopsy Laboratory at Hospital Puerta de Hierro. Uh, I work at the Medical Oncology Department. And I'm going to be talking about the clinical utility of liquid biopsy for the management of cancer patients, more specifically for the management of lung cancer patients. Okay, so by liquid biopsy, we refer to several approaches we can conduct to obtain um, molecular information for the tum from the tumors in an uninvasive way. Uh, there are many components in the blood that we can analyze, such as CTCs, uh, e uh, EVs or extracellular vesicles, proteins, RNA, circulating tumor DNA, I'm going to be focusing. Um, I'm going to be focused mostly in the analysis of circulating tumor DNA. So, there is circulating free DNA in the bloodstream because uh, dying, dying cells shed DNA into the bloodstream, and in cancer patients, a, a small proportion of this circulating free DNA is actually circulating tumor DNA. So the analysis of circulating tumor DNA has been shown to be useful for non-invasive biomarker testing. This is especially important in some cancer patients, such as, for example, uh, lung cancer patient, patients in whom uh, it is sometimes difficult to obtain a biopsy with sufficient material for biomarker testing. Um, because ctDNA levels has been shown uh, to correlate well with tumor bulk, it is uh, ctDNA quantification. It is also useful to monitor uh, cancer disease. Um, also, using very sensitive techniques, uh, we can use ctDNA or liquid body for minimal residual disease monitoring. Of course, we can genotype uh, or we can do uh, molecular profiling over the course of treatment of disease and this can give us information about the uh, clonal evolution of the tumors. And also, there is now an intense research in uh, evaluating the utility of ctDNA in, in, in the screening programs. And I guess that uh, probably in the future, radiomics, combining radiomics with uh, liquid biopsy uh, would yield very, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, good results and, and may may facilitate uh, the incorporation of in, in screening effect, effective screening programs, which uh, may have an impact on on survival, especially in some cancers such as lung cancer. Uh, the amount of ctDNA depends on tumor type, size, stage, and metastasis. There are some some tissues such as, for example, brain or bone shed little uh, DNA into the bloodstream. And of course, size, stage, and metastasis, uh, the amount of ctDNA depends on size, stage, and metastasis. And that is why ctDNA has been shown to be of, of prognostic significance. 
So regarding technical issue, uh, we uh, of course uh, the most uh, yeah, used sample is blood, uh, but there is circulating tumor DNA in other liquids, such as for example urine. And in this um, paper we published a couple of years ago, uh, we showed that cDNA from body fluids is an adequate uh, source for biomarker testing. Uh, this was uh, performed on lung cancer patients uh, with an year of farm mutations. And here what we saw it is that the amount of circulating tumor DNA in malignant effusions that occurred as a consequence of disease progression. So the amount of circulating tumor DNA in this sample is very high and therefore these samples are very informative and should not be discarded uh, for biomarker testing uh, in some cases because uh, uh, they may be mm, really helpful in some situations. Uh, more sophisticated, uh, we saw uh, in, in, in this paper, we show it that peritoneal washings, which are routine able uh, performed in ovarian cancer patients, these peritoneal washings are uh, an adequate source for, for somatic uh, BRCA testing. And so in this paper, we saw a very high uh, concordance between FPP sample and the peritoneal washing samples. Uh, so this uh, might be useful, this, this starting material might be useful when the FPP samples are not sufficient or the quality of, uh, of the sample is not enough or for NGS procedure for whatever reason. Uh, of course, uh, if we want to analyze circulating tumor DNA, we need uh, techniques with a very low limit of detection, uh, below uh, 0.1% or lower. Um, so um, several technologies such as NGS plans or digital PCR have uh, been shown to be uh, adequate for this, this kind of analysis. Here I'm showing um, a correlation between two uh, different uh, digital PCR platforms, Absolute Q and Quant Studio, and you can see a perfect correlation between both uh, technologies. This is also uh, an old paper from our lab in which we uh, tested the, or the agreement between NGS and CTDNA uh, and digital PCR, sorry, for CTDNA genotyping, and we show it a very uh, high agreement. And in the same way, this is a bigger study um, in which we evaluated the agreement between seven methodologies for non-invasive biomarker testing. Specifically, we evaluated two different NGS platforms, uh, three digital platforms, and two FDA platforms. And overall, we show it that uh, digital platforms and NGS platforms had higher sensitivity than FDA approved platforms and that um, most discordant calls occurred when the mutation was detected at very low allele frequencies. So it is very important to assess um, the quality of variant calls because in liquid biopsy and uh, in some cases, um, in most cases, uh, mutations are detected at very low uh, allele frequencies. In order to assess the variant, of, uh, the, it's to assess the quality, sorry, of a variant called, we developed uh, this score, which we named it uh, R scope. And this score takes into account two parameters. One is the, is the MAPD, which refers to the uniformity in coverage uh, in a given cold and the other is the allele frequency. So combining these two uh, parameters into this formula, uh, we um, cal can calculate the R score. And here in this paper, we saw it that the concordance between two different NGS platforms in assessing in, in, in variant calls was um, very poor uh, when R score was very high. On the contrary, uh, with a very low R score, the, the agreement between um, NGS platforms in variant calls was uh, almost perfect. Uh, here you can uh, nicely see that there is a, 
a very uh, high correlation between the agreement uh, in uh, assessing a variant code and the R score. So, as I mentioned, cgDNA profiling has been shown to be an adequate method to inform clinical decision making, especially in non small cell lung cancer as ctDNA and GS profiling has been shown to be highly concordant with tissue and GS profiling. What is more important is that adding plasma ctDNA sequencing to tissue genotyping in the clinical setting uh, would increase the detection of targetable mutations and therefore will expand the possibility for a targeted, a targeted therapy in a given patient. Um, in any case, uh, if we don't find uh, any mutation in the plasma of a given patient, we should uh, try as much as we can uh, to genotype the tumor tissue to confirm and detect results in the plasma sample. One of the most important uh, approaches of liquid biopsy is uh, molecular profiling upon uh, disease progression. So once uh, a patient has uh, been diagnosed as having progression, progressive disease, um, it is very difficult to obtain, for example, in lung cancer patients, a tissue biopsy because uh, in most cases, the patient uh, is unwilling or uh, the healthy conditions uh, are not um, adequate to undergo an, an, an invasive procedure. So, uh, a few uh, years ago, when osirmetinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, was uh, uh, used as a second-line treatment in EFR-positive non-small cell lung cancer patients uh, after the patient had, uh, was diagnosed as having a progressive uh, disease, the liquid biopsy and digital PCR uh, were very useful to identify patients who could benefit from this drug because um, the tumors uh, had to have to be positive for the T790M resistance mutation. And it is very easy and it rather cheap to test a single mutation uh, by digital PCR. Of course, this uh, scenario is now a little bit obsolete because oxymetinib is... Uh, used mostly as a first line treatment and not as a second line. Uh, but um, it is still in some scenarios could be useful to uh, analyze a single mutation by digital PCR. In this uh, paper we have published last year, we, uh, we demonstrated that the prevalence of the G12C mutation in Keras was 1% in EFR positive uh, in non small cell lung cancer patients after progressing on a first uh, line treatment with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So it is well established that, well, well established that KRAS mutations and EFR mutations are mutually exclusive, uh, but it's also well established that uh, KRAS uh, mutations may appear as a consequence of uh, resistance or so as, as a mechanism of resistance to uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And specifically, by, in this paper, we genotype it by using the digital PCR 500 samples, and we could uh, uh, estimate that the prevalence of this uh, druggable mutation is 1% in these patients upon disease uh, progression. Um, sorry. A, a similar scenario uh, is in out positive tumors. So, out positive uh, uh, translocations in, in ALK uh, occur in about 5% uh, of non small adenocarcinomas, non small cell lung cancers. And these patients uh, can benefit from, um, um, from several uh, target targeted therapies. Um, unfortunately, uh, pace, uh, tumors uh, progress uh, due to the development of uh, resistance uh, mechanisms and 
resistance mutations, many several resistance mutations have been described in the ALK locus. The important thing here is not that uh, a given mutation may confer resistance to a given drug, but not to all of them. And knowing the molecular status uh, at disease progression would, would help to better uh, prescribe second line and third line treatment in these patients because they, uh, in this way, the oncologist would know uh, if the drug uh, if the drug is um, effective in a in a given tumor. Uh, so. In this way, we perform a study in which 24 uh, um, non-small cell lung cancer patients with an alt translocation were included. Uh, they were all metastatic. And a sample, a uh, blood sample was collected upon disease progressions. In our hands, about uh, one third of the patients, or um, more than one third of the patients, had um, resistance mutation in the alt locus. And these are the mutations that we the, we detected, uh, which is concordance in, uh, with the, uh, what it has been published. So again, uh, this article showed that at least for this for this subset of patients, and uh, knowing the molecular um, status or the mole molecular profile upon disease progression would uh, help to optimize uh, second and third uh, line treatment. Analyzing fusions uh, uh, such as translocations is more challenging. Uh, uh, in, the, in the solid tumors, uh, ALK fusions are, um, are uh, identified by PIS, immunohistochemistry, or NGS. In the liquid biopsy, we can identify a fusion uh, by, uh, in the ctDNA, by genotyping the ctDNA, but this would require to use a large panel and, uh, and, and a very high, uh, and, and read the, the, the panel at a very high coverage. Um, and we can also, uh, another approach is to sequence the fusion transcript at the, at the RNA level. However, the RNA in the blood degrades very easily, and therefore one approach would be to um, analyze the RNA inside the exosomes or platelets, which is uh, protected from the RNAs in the blood. Uh, so uh, we, um, in, in, in a study we performed, we wanted to, to know whether these ALK fusion transcripts are present in extracellular vesicles from uh, ALK positive non small cell lung cancer patients. And also, we tested it. this was also true um, in cell lines harboring this alteration. So, uh, in our hands, we could demonstrate that the fusion transcript at the mRNA level and at the protein level uh, is present in the extracellular vesicles from. Uh, the cell lines and also from the from the patients. Uh, this was demonstrated for the first time, as far as we know. And um, importantly, uh, we uh, characterize very well this vesicle according to MISEF uh, guidelines. So we characterize the vesicles by electron microscopy, NTA, exoview. And more importantly, we could uh, demonstrate that the fusion transcript, the ALK fusion, was present in exosomes, in, in vesicles, in extracellular vesicles from uh, the cell lines, uh, and also in extracellular vesicles uh, from the tumor. So the blue dots correspond to the ALK fusions. And this was also demonstrated at the protein level. So here I'm showing the Western blot, uh, where the uh, vesicles from the from the uh, cell lines harboring this alteration so that there is diffusion at the protein level and not in the melanoma cell, which is not uh, uh, do not harbor this alteration. And uh, in the right, uh, in, in the left side is the, the, the Western rock from lysates. And that, of course, uh, you can see again that the, the fusion protein is present in the cell lines, but not in the melanoma cell line. And this was also demonstrated uh, in a different experiment uh, in a dot blood. 
So uh, this is very important because uh, this opens the door for a non-invasive biomarker testing based on EVs. And I think now the challenge is uh, on developing methods for uh, obtaining uh, EVs containing this information in a more efficient way uh, or in a, in, in a very efficient way that can be uh, uh, can be incorporated in the clinical, in, in, in daily oncology, in the clinical setting. So regarding moritonin, as I mentioned, the amount of circulating tumor DNA uh, correlates well with, uh, with uh, tumor bulk. This is an old paper from our lab in which um, uh, a cohort of EGFR positive non-small cell lung cancer patients were monitored uh, by CTDNA um, using digital PCR. And here you can see uh, in the uh, left uh, figure, uh, in the left panel, that uh, the, the corresponds to uh, monitor the CTDNA levels um, in, a, in a patient with an EGFR positive non small cell lung cancer. So, as you can see at baseline, the CTDNA levels were very high. Uh, the orange line corresponds to the original EFR sensitizing mutation, and this corresponds with the image uh, labeled with the star A, in which uh, you could see very clearly that there was an uptake in the CT scan in the lung and liver and in many places. And this uh, patient did very well, as you can see, and with no detectable mutations a uh, uh, few after the start of the treatment with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and corresponding with the image uh, labeled uh, with the V-star. Uh, however, after a while, the patient was diagnosed as having a, a, as having disease progression. And also it was seen a, an increase, but very slight, a slight increase in circulating tumor DNA level in the plasma sample. However, this patient had um, um, pericardial effusion due to a malignant pericardial effusion. And in this case, the presence of the resistant mutation, the T790M resistant mutation, could be clearly detected by digital PCR analyzing uh, the pericardial um, the fluid. So again, uh, malignant effusions uh, that occur as a consequence of disease progressions are very um, uh, informative in some cases. And in this case, as you can see uh, in the blue line, uh, the, the, the T790A mutation was hardly detected uh, in the plasma sample. So many authors uh, has proposed that CTDNA could be incorporated in the TNM systems with help uh, helps oncologists to assess the prognostic of a given patient because the amount of ctdna as i mentioned before is of prognostic significance we have also seen this in, in in several studies here i'm presenting a study conducted by the spanish lung cancer group in which uh, 80 28 hospitals uh, participated in this study 228 uh, EGFR positive non-small cell lung cancer patients were included and 830 liquid biopsies were analyzed. Samples were connected, uh, were collected, sorry, uh, before uh, the start of the treatment at three, six months and a disease progression. And as you can see, circulating tumor DNA levels at baselines uh, before treatment were of prognostic significance. So in the kaplan mayer curve that is presented uh, in the right side, uh, you can see that the patients with low CTDNA level represented by the green line had significantly improved uh, overall survival compared with patients with high circulating tumor DNA levels at baseline represented by the yellow line. In addition, uh, CTDNA was uh, useful to monitor treatment so uh, in this kaplan major curves, you can see, you can focus maybe on the uh, kaplan major curves for overall survival, which is the one on the right side. The one on the left side is for progression-free survival. So in this kaplan major curve, the yellow line represents those patients that did not respond to therapy. 
So these were patients that in which a cDNA was still detectable after three or six months of treatment. Green line represent to patient, represents patients that uh, had um, uh, that became cDNA negative after three or six months of treatment, but uh, patients who uh, had very high levels of cDNA at baseline. And the yellow line, you can see that have a clear, uh, better um, overall survival, corresponds to those patients uh, that had very low levels of circulating tumor DNA at baseline. And, uh, and these patients, all of them, had uh, uh, became cDNA negative after three or six months of treatment. So clearly, cDNA is a prognostic factor uh, that can be used to stratify the risk uh, of progression of death and death in, in cancer patients and in lung cancer patients. This is another example in, in the same way, in another context. Uh, this is a clinical trial in which the efficacy of venorabine was evaluated. But again, in this context, uh, completely different from the, uh, the, the previous one, uh, cDNA was of prognostic significance. And finally, I'm going to be focusing on the role of cDNA in the neoadjuvant setting. So the new, and for this, I'm going to be focused or uh, based on the uh, data reported uh, in the Nadine clinical trial. So the new adjuvant treatment is the treatment that is given to a patient before surgery. And in this Nadine clinical trial, uh, 46 non-small cell lung cancer patients that were diagnosed as having a stage 3A disease and whose tumors uh, were considered to be resectable by a multidisciplinary team. So these patients were treated with neoadjuvant nivulumab plus chemotherapy, and subsequently the uh, patients underwent surgery, and then they were treated for one year uh, with adjuvant therapy. It has to be said that, the, pro that uh, the statistics for this subset of patients before the Nadine trial was that um, more or less that um, only one third of the patients, about 30% of the patients, uh, were alive after uh, three years uh, uh, from treatment. And in Nadine trial, this probability raised over 80%. In this trial, all the uh, trial endpoints were met, and this progression-free survival, which was the first, uh, the first uh, trial endpoint, was 77.1%. The, the primary endpoint, sorry. Uh, these results were further uh, confirmed by another important trial, which is the Checkmate A16. This is a phase three trial, a uh, randomized uh, trial, and uh, confirmed the uh, results of Nadine trial. And therefore, subsequently, uh, this uh, uh, scheme was approved by uh, FDA on March this year. So there is a now great interest to explore um, different combinations in the neoadjuvant setting. And in this scenario, we need uh, survival surrogates that, that can be measured faster than overall survival and progression-free survival in order to accelerate uh, the, the, the approval of some drugs or the approval of some combination or in, 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 in essence to accelerate uh, research. Uh, so it has been shown uh, very clearly by Nadine investigator and also by Checkmate investigators that pathological uh, response uh, uh, is a good surrogate for uh, overall survival and progression-free survival. Uh, so uh, in both trials, uh, pathological complete response and that is having no 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 tumor cells in the primary tumor when the, the, the tumor is removed after surgery or uh, nor in the lymph nodes having no no malignant cells in lymph nodes uh, significantly correlates uh, with uh, survival and, and also the nadine 2 which uh, the, the kaplan major school for nadine 2 are presented in the lower part uh, confirmed this this data the question is, uh, can uh, circulating tumor DNA help uh, also in this in this this year and contains analysis of circulating tumor DNA in Nadine clinical samples, among other results. 
And here we saw it that in addition Patients who had undetectable circulating tumor DNA after neoadjuvant treatment have significantly improved uh, progression free survival and overall survival, indicated that this is a good uh, surrogate for survival. Uh, on the contrary, clinical response, as I said, on CT scans, scans did not predict uh, uh, survival outcomes. So in this trial, CTDNA was analyzed by uh, the, using the oncomine uh, circulating free DNA assays. And here in this uh, kaplan mayer curves, uh, uh, well, I'm presenting several kaplan mayer curves. Uh, I, it has to be said that in the Nadim trial, baseline, uh, that is pretreatment circulating tumor DNA levels were also prognostic significance. Uh, this is the kaplan mayer curve in the upper left corner. So in blue line uh, 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 represents patients with low CTDNA levels at baselines, and the yellow line represents patients with high CTDNA level at baseline. And you can see that uh, patients with low CTDNA levels at baseline had significantly improved outcome. Regarding uh, what happens after neoadjuvant treatment, uh, you can see in the upper right kaplan mayer curve that all patients with a pathological complete response, none of the patients with a pathological complete response uh, had disease. That is that all patients uh, that had a pathological complete response are alive or were alive at the time of data cutoff. And similarly, patients who became CDDNA negative after neoadjuvant treatment had significantly improved uh, overall survival. Uh, so patients with undetectable levels uh, uh, of CDDNA after treatments are represented by the blue line uh, in this uh, kaplan mayer curve. On the contrary, as I mentioned, uh, the clinical response assessed on CT scans did not predict as well uh, survival. And you can see that the kaplan mayer curves, which is in the lower part at, uh, on the left side, do not separate as nicely as in the other cases. So finally, some limit, the my major or one of the most important limitations of the liquid uh, of CDDNA genotyping is clonal hematopoiesis, uh, somatic uh, mutations, uh, or derived mutations, so clonal hematopoiesis, derived mutation, not somatic mutation, sorry. So this, uh, these uh, mutations um, uh, in blood, uh, this comes from the blood cells or bone marrow, but without the diagnosis of any hematological malignancy. And these mutations are more frequent in, pace, in age patients and in patients with solid tumors, and of course are more uh, likely to be detected with deeper sequencing approaches, and is the most important source for false positive calls. Um, this uh, many studies have shown that the uh, the the prevalence of clonal hematopoiesis derived mutations uh, increases with age, uh, and in some solid tumors such as non-small cell lung cancer, which are diagnosing more elderly people, pues the the prevalence of uh, somatic mutations is uh, rather high. So um, therefore. Uh, developing pipelines to filter out these mutations as well as the germline line mutations is really important in, in, in uh, the liquid biopsy uh, field. And that is all I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, the Spanish uh, Lung Cancer Group and all the collaborators. And I'm very happy to uh, respond to any, any question from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Atosha, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Now let's get started. Our first question um, is, does CFDNA extraction method have an impact on CFDNA analysis? Um, so um, 
in a study we have conducted uh, some years ago, uh, we demonstrated that the bioanalyzer profile uh, of ctDNA could be different according to the extraction method, although we could not demonstrate an impact on ctDNA genotyping. If this uh, uh, difference in the populations that were recovered uh, had an impact on biomarker testing. Uh, it has been documented by many uh, researchers that circulating free DNA recovery um, it can, can be different depending on the extraction method. And I think that uh, reproducibility and robustness in this uh, peranalytical phase uh, is going to be crucial in order to incorporate uh, ctDNA quantification uh, for, CD, for clinical uh, decision making. Great, thank you for that. Um, our next question is, do existing cell-free DNA methods achieve the sensitivity needed for detecting minimal residual disease, MRD? So now there is a, a lot of interest in, in, in uh, liquid biocy-based uh, method for, for detecting and measuring minimal residual disease. Uh, it appears that uh, combining uh, methylation and genomic uh, signals uh, can improve uh, sensitivity and probably uh, uh, combining this information with imaging information, maybe with uh, uh, radiomics, I think that uh, would be a, a good approach for, for uh, measuring this minimal residual disease as well as for maybe screening programs. Great. Um, another question is, what is the percentage of false positive? So uh, in the RIN trial, I, I guess uh, this question is related to the uh, RIN trial that, uh, that was uh, presented uh, uh, in my presentation in a uh, slide in heaven. Uh, so for the RIN trial, uh, we published that the uh, sensitivity of uh, different techniques uh, was uh, the, the specificity of uh, uh, NGS and digital PCR was 100% specificity for exon 21 and exon 19 uh, deletions detection in EFR gene. And this sensitivity uh, specificity uh, was a little bit lower for the detection of the T790M uh, resistant mutations, but it was also um, fairly high. And this is because the, the, this resistant mutation is always detected at, at a lower allele frequencies because it appears uh, uh, in a late stage over uh, in the disease. And uh, yeah, I, if, I, I hope I have answered your question in, in, in the RIN trial in which we, we evaluated the sensitivity and specificity of different techniques. That was the specificity that was reported 100% for exon 21 in of EGFR and 100% for exon 19 and a little bit lower for t 7 IDM resistant mutation in, in EGFR. Hey, it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, do you think ctDNA will replace pathological response or clinical response? No, I don't think uh, ctDNA will replace the, any of them. Uh, but I think it will help and will uh, improve uh, the way we measured uh, tumor response to treatment and maybe incorporating uh, ctDNA uh, clearance uh, will help uh, oncologists to better estimate uh, uh, tumor uh, response to treatment together with the pathological information. Great. Thank you again, Atosha, for your time today and your important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcasts. Um, before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those that will be submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with any one of your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.